So in this video, I want to have a look at rates of change and in particular focus on straight line motion or what's called kinematics. And straight line motion is motion as it suggests in a straight line. So these little guys over here just drive forwards and then reverse back. They don't turn around, they just go forwards and back. So you have a start position and then just like this little dot's going to do, it goes forwards and back. Anything to the right hand side of the start position, we consider to be a positive direction. And anything to the left hand side, we consider to be a negative direction. It just goes forward and back, forward and back. And so we talk about in straight line motion, motion displacement, which is the distance and the direction of that particular dot from the origin. So if this is the origin here, out this way, it would have a positive value um, and it would have the positive value of, say for example, um, if this was the number three on the number line, it would have a positive three. If it went out this way to minus two, it would have minus two. And so what we get, as you can see, the displacement changes with time. So where that dot is, how far it is from the origin, changes with time. And so our function is displacement with respect to time. And we use x for displacement, the letter x. And so you can see that x is now a function of t. So for example, if we had x of t, x of 2 is equal to minus 3, that means when t is equal to 2, the object is 3 units. Negative direction means to the left. Okay, so displacement is not the total distance traveled. It is how far it is from the origin. So if I start at the origin here, my displacement is 1. Now I go back, my displacement is zero, but I've actually traveled a distance of two units. Now my displacement is minus one, and I've traveled a distance, total distance of three units. Now my displacement is minus two, but I've traveled a total distance of four units. Can you see the difference between displacement and distance? They're not the same thing. So displacement is always how far am I from that yellow dot? How far am I from that yellow dot? Now, I've been moving the dot left and right. You can also use displacement with vertical motion. So here, if I throw a ball in the air, it goes up in a positive direction. If I drop the ball to the ground, it goes down in a negative direction, but it still has this straight line motion. Okay, so it's only in the one direct one plane. So it's up and down a line. So it's either up and down or left and right. It can in fact, I shouldn't say that it can in fact go in this direction, but it's always, if you like, in front of or behind the origin. So that's displacement. So the other two concepts you need to know with uh, kinematics are what we call velocity and acceleration. So in about year nine, you would have worked with speed and speed is equal to distance over time. So hopefully this formula is uh, not new to you. Speed equals distance over time. Now speed, when we're traveling in a car, we're talking about just the quantity. How fast are we going? Whereas velocity, we're working with this, so this is velocity here, V for velocity, we're working with displacement, which has a distance, well, or a length, if you like, but also a direction. And so our velocity will have a direction as well. So our speed is defined as our, sorry, our velocity is defined as our speed and in what direction we're moving. It's called a vector quantity as it has both size and direction. Whereas the speed formula that we learnt in year nine is what we call a scalar quantity as it only has a size, it doesn't have a direction. Okay, so 
we have that the displacement is the equivalent of distance and we have that velocity is the equivalent of speed but both of these things are in a direction. So if we follow this idea and go back to our speed distance time formula, our speed was our change in distance over our change in time. So the equivalent is that our velocity, our average velocity, is our change in displacement, the equivalent of distance, over the change in time. Now when we graph displacement versus time, on our x-axis we'll have t's for time, which means on our vertical axis we'll have our variable for displacement, which will be x's on here. So our average velocity formula is the difference between, or the gradient between these two points. So the average velocity is the gradient of a displacement time graph. And so this is just the formula for y2 minus y1 equals x2 minus x1, but using our new variables. Okay, now the word acceleration is a word that you should be familiar with and when you accelerate in a car, you change speed. So your acceleration is your change in velocity divided by your change in time. So again, if you are got a graph of your velocity or your speed versus time, and you're at this point at time one and at this point at time two, your average acceleration is the slope of this line. And so your formula for average acceleration is just the gradient formula for these two points. On our vertical axis, our variable is V, so it'll be V2 minus V1. And on our horizontal axis, we've got time, of course, so it'll be T2 minus T1. So as we've seen, velocity is the gradient of the line for displacement and time, and acceleration is the gradient of the line joining the two points on a velocity graph, which means that if we take this idea and take it to the limit, we will also come up with instantaneous velocity and instantaneous acceleration. So we have that velocity is a change in x values over the change in t values, which we can write as dx dt, the d standing for small delta, which is this is a little Greek letter delta, meaning a change. And so we have the v is dx dt. Velocity is the derivative of displacement. We also have that acceleration is a change in velocity, or dv, divided by a change in time, dt. And so our acceleration is the derivative of the velocity. So we know that velocity is in fact the derivative of the displacement. So what we've got here is a derivative of a derivative. And if we multiply this together, what we get, oops, what we get is this formula here, that the acceleration is the two d's multiplied to give you d squared and our x, and dt, oops, that is missing a squared, dt squared. Now this is called the second derivative, and you can get your CAS calculator to find this, so you don't actually have to find the velocity and then find the derivative again to find the acceleration. Your CAS will do this. And what we've got is that the acceleration is the second derivative of displacement. I'll show you how it works on the CAS in just one sec. So let's look at a question. A pigeon is sitting on a power line watching a cat below. There he is there. As the cat moves, the pigeon moves sideways along the wire, to the left and to the right along the wire. The position of the pigeon can be modelled by the equation thing there for that domain where x is measured in metres and t is measured in minutes. 
And so we have three questions. At what time is the pigeon at rest, staying still? When does the pigeon return to its original position? And what is the pigeon's speed and acceleration when it returns to its original position? Now you'll notice the word here says speed. Okay, so often in these questions, speed and velocity are used interchangeably. We're gonna find the velocity. Okay, so I'm gonna do this whole thing by hand, so it's gonna be a little bit tedious. If you don't wanna do it, if you don't wanna sit there and watch it be done by hand, then by all means fast forward, as you've probably already done numerous times before. Um, and then at the end, I'll show you how to do it um, quite quickly on your CAS calculator. So part A, the pigeon being at rest means a pigeon is staying still, which means it's not moving, so its velocity is equal to zero. And so that means we're going to need to find our velocity. And our velocity is the derivative of our x function. So our x function is currently written in factorised form. To find the derivative, we don't have a product function for three things. We only have a product function for two things. You could um, multiply this in here, but it's just simpler to just expand it out and find the derivative. And then set the derivative equal to zero and solve. That doesn't factorise nicely, so you'll need to use the quadratic formula. Here's the quadratic formula off to the side here. Um, notice that the quadratic formula is written in x, but in our case, it's t. As you can see, in ours, it's t. So as you can see, I've written here t is equal to, in the exam, please don't write x is equal to, because x in our the context of our question is the displacement. All right, so it's t. t is equal to, Substitute your values for A, B and C in. Simplify, simplify, simplify. So um, I've, I'm looking here to see if I can simplify this square root. So 28 is 4 times 7. So I can square root the 4 to give me 2 root 7. Then I can take a common factor of 2 out of the top line and then cancel with the, the cancel with the six, so that should be a three. So if I was doing this by hand and I wanted to just double check what, the, what those values were, I could use this idea that the square root of sit, seven sits between the square root of four and the square root of nine, and the square root of four is two and the square root of nine is three. So the square root of seven is somewhere between two and three. So this value here is somewhere between two and three. So it's four plus or minus, let's say two and a half over three. Neither of the, or all of the values that we get from that, if that's about two and a half or somewhere between two and three are all going to be positive values, okay? So that means that they are possible values because our domain for T is that t is between 0 and 5. And so we just need to check that both of our answers fit within this domain, and both of them do. And you can see that I've written the answers and their units because it's t, we're measuring our t in minutes, so I've put the value and the units. Our second part of the question asks us, when does the bird return to its original position? So its original position means that its displacement will be zero, which means that our x value will be zero. And so we need to solve our equation for x to zero. And when we solve that, we get three values. Now, again, we need to check with our domain for t, which is between 0 and 5, inclusive, so that looks okay. But the other thing that you need to be aware of is that the question asks, when does it return to its original position? So our t equals 0 is not part of our answers. And so our final answer is 1 and 3 minutes. And then finally, 
The last question asks for the speed and the acceleration when the pigeon returns to its original position. So we know speed, I said we're going to use it as the equivalent of velocity, so it's dx dt and acceleration is dv dt. And so we will find both of those. And to find the acceleration, so um, the velocity we found before, to find the acceleration, we just find the derivative of this function, which is 6t minus 8. And then we substitute in t is equal to 1 into both of those equations and simplify. And at t is equal to 1 minute, the velocity is minus 2 meters per minute so our x units here are in meters these are in meters and these are in minutes minutes and for our velocity our velocity units are meters per minute so this is meters per minute and this is minutes here so our units for acceleration are meters per minute divided by minutes or times by 1 over minutes, which is how we get metres per minute squared. We do the same with t equals 3 because we had two times that it re returned to its original position. And this time we get an acceleration of 6 metres per minute and, sorry, a velocity of 6 metres per minute velocity of 6 meters per minute and acceleration of 10 meters per minute. So I'll just box that up so that it's easy for the person marking my question to see. And then finally, I want to show you how I would go about doing this on the CAS calculator. And so the easiest way to do this, because I'm using this x function over and over, is to define x. And then I've just simply asked it to solve for the derivative of x. So I haven't even found the derivative of x. I've just given it an instruction to solve that derivative equal to 0. And here are my two answers. Now it's given me something completely weird here. This, if you um, expand this negative through, is in fact the um, is in fact that becomes minus root 7 plus 4 over 3. Um, for, so that was for part A. This section here is for part A. And again, if I was doing this in an exam situation, I would still be checking whether, and I would use my, um, I would use my evaluate button here. I would um, take copy this and ask it using the um, control enter to tell me what decimal values these were so I could check that it sat within the domain. This is for part B. And this bit here is for part B. But again, you have to think about the answer. Remember, the um, it said return to, and so you can't just write down what your CAS did. And this last section, so it is this one and this one, is part C and to you to do part C I used the um, menu formula and found derivative at a point and what I put in was I put in just you can see here you can see over here that I actually put in both t values at the same time now it won't work here, well, I didn't put it in brackets, maybe I should have. I just put in one and then I adjust it when I get to here. So when you put this into your CAS calculator, it will come up with d dt and then it'll come up with a box for you to put in and it'll come up with t is equal to one. That's what it will pop up on your screen. And then all I did was changed, put the x in here and then changed this value here. This one here has that second derivative that I showed you before for acceleration. And to get the second derivative to come up, all I did with the derivative at a point, you can see you've got first derivative, you've also got second derivative here. And that's all I did to select 
that. And then I didn't have to find um, the derivative formula and then get it to find the derivative from there. I just used the second derivative. But hopefully you can see that even though you can solve these things on your CAS and it, it pops out all of the answers, you still need to be thinking about what are the restrictions for your domain? What does it imply in the question is or isn't included? And that's an area that um, students lose marks on because they just write down what the calculator says without taking that extra step of thinking, is this a valid answer? Because remember, the CAS is just working on a function, is just working on a function, whereas the question is working on a situation and sometimes the situation brings with it implied domains and restrictions, implied domains and restrictions. I'll just put implied stuff. So watch out for those.